Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alec, and I will be working in the background to help any, any, answer any general or technical questions that you may have. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few tools that you will have at your disposal throughout today's session. The audio control is located directly beneath the slides. Adjust the volume by sliding the indicator to the right on this panel. Please be sure to adjust your computer speaker volume as needed. There will be no dial-in number provided for today's webinar. Here's a list of the buttons found at the bottom of your screen. Please take a moment and familiarize yourself with them. If you're unsure what a button does, simply hover your mouse over the button and a description will appear. To join the ongoing live discussion of today's webinar, please access the group chat by clicking on that blue group chat icon. Please send your questions and all technical issues via the Ask a Question box. Click on the purple icon marked Q&A, type in your question, and click Submit. We will be tweeting during today's session. Feel free to follow along using the Twitter widget or your mobile device at hashtag WFWebinar with at Workforce News. Have some answers to some frequently asked questions. You will receive a link to the recording of the webinar and a follow-up e email. Please allow at least two business days before that information is sent. A PDF of the slides can be downloaded right now via the resource list to the right of the slides in your console. There's a few other options there for you today. The HRCI and SHRM certification codes for today's webinar will appear in the certification box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen once the required watch time has elapsed. So please keep your eyes on that for when those codes will appear. All right, now I'm going to pass the presentation over to our moderator, Bravetta Hassel, Associate Editor, Workforce Magazine, to do the formal introduction of today's speaker. Bravetta. Thank you for that introduction, Alec. Today we're diving to the science behind well-being. We've all watched corporate wellness mature from anti-smoking efforts and on-site gyms to today's focus on overall employee well-being. But do you have a good grasp on the data and science that backs this shift up? Many may think of well-being as fluff, but we're here today to show that science, the science that's behind, which proves otherwise. Our presenter today is Dr. Laura Hamill, Chief People Officer at Limeade, a corporate wellness technology company that measurably improves health, well-being, and performance. Laura is responsible for leading the HR while nurturing the Limeade culture of improvement. Prior to Limeade, Laura owned Paris Phoenix Group, an organizational research and assessment consulting firm focused on improving employee engagement, cultural alignment, and creating evidence-based talent management systems. She also worked at Microsoft as a director of people research. I know you'll enjoy today's webinar and the chance to interact with our speaker. So let's get started. Laura? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm really this topic of well-being is one that I have experienced on a personal level and for sure on a professional level. I got involved in this area about 10 years ago. The first way was really on a personal level. I had my own kind of well-being aha experience about 10 years ago. I was in this place where I was sort of dreading going to work. I didn't really want to go there every day. And at the same time, I also had been diagnosed with two autoimmune diseases, and my kids were saying things to me that made me realize that they weren't loving the mom that they were having. I was stressed out, and they were letting me know that they could see that in me. And I really was at a point where I didn't have any time to spend with my friends. So it was all really coming together, This all these different aspects of my life where I realized, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm really not living the life that I want to live. So after thinking hard about it, I decided I needed to change some things, and I decided to um, leave my job and start my own consulting business. And so that's how I got involved with well-being then on a professional level. My very first customer was um, the CEO of Limeade, and he really wanted to start a company that was focused on well-being. So I got this great opportunity to be able to do research on the topic of well-being for us to develop our well-being model and our assessment that we still use today. So well-being is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and um, I feel like a lot of people can tend to relate to this because they have their own personal experiences as well. So we're going to dig into this concept of well-being, and the way I'd like to do this is first start with a definition and then talk about how the, the whole area of wellness and well-being has really evolved and then talk about how we measure well-being and improve it, and a little bit about the future direction this, this um, whole area is going to. And in order to talk about 
science. There really, to me, are three fundamental areas that are important to define if you're thinking about the, a topic being an area that's a true science. The first one is around really just having a theoretical foundation. So what are we basing this, this concept of well-being on? And then what's the methodology? How do we measure things? How do we really study this? And then finally, what are, what's the research and evidence that we're starting to create? So as we go through um, this time together, I'm hoping to really cover that, to help show you a little bit of the theoretical foundation, what the methodology for well-being really is, and then how we have really created evidence and research on this topic. So let's start with the definition of well-being. So the idea behind well-being, it's not, it's not about the absence of physical illness or the absence of mental illness. It's actually the addition of good things. So it's, it's about being optimized and actualized. So the, the concept is really around are you thriving? Are you living the best life? So sometimes people talk about it in terms of the word happiness. And, you know, happiness is part of well-being because you do need to be satisfied and content and feel positive, but it's not happiness alone. It's not just that positive feeling by itself. It really has to be coupled with the idea of striving and thriving and realizing your potential. So happiness plus the idea of thriving is really what well-being is. Again, it's not the absence of bad things, it's the addition of good things. An important caveat in this area is that nobody but you gets to decide if you have well-being in your life. It very much is a subjective assessment of whether or not you're feeling happy and you're feeling like you're thriving. So it's really important that we realize that I could look at somebody and see kind of their life on a piece of paper, and I might say, gosh, they have, they, I'm sure they have well-being in their life. But if they don't feel that, if they don't believe that, that's really all that matters. So, And just the opposite is true as well. So I can look at somebody and think that they don't have well-being in their life based on all kinds of hardships they're going through, but the way that they've decided to think about their life, the way that they're thinking about um, their happiness and, and whether or not they're really realizing their potential is really all that matters. So there are a couple fundamental theories behind the idea of well-being. And probably one of the most fundamental ones is this theory called self-determination theory. And what it's about is how do people grow? How do they really stay motivated? And there are three areas that have been really well studied and well supported that say you've got to have these things in place if you really want to have a positive life, a good life. So the first one is the idea of autonomy, and it's do you have choice and control in your life? Do you have something that you feel like you get to make decisions about? The next one is around feeling competent, feeling like you're effective in an area, feeling like you're able to master something. And then finally, the idea of relatedness. And this is about feeling like you belong, feeling like you have connections with other people. These three topics um, are interestingly a lot of uh, wellness software really focuses on these three areas, and, and actually just software in general. You think about your experience with a lot of apps that are available now. It's really about do you, you get to control something. It's about showing you through maybe different levels or different rewards that you're competent and having some sort of aspect that's social in the experience. So. These three areas are pretty fundamental to how people learn and grow and, and a pretty important part of well-being. Another theory that was really fundamental when we were um, working on this concept of well-being 10 years ago is RIFT's model of psychological well-being. Um, it's very much focused on you know, more of what's going on inside a person's head, a little bit um, removed from physical well-being, but it's a very important component that it builds on the self-determination theory, but it adds some other pieces that are pretty important. Um, the idea of having purpose in your life, having meaning and direction, and really that you are um, accepting yourself as well. 
So there's some similarities with the self-determination theory, but it really expands and grows. And this, there have been some pretty interesting research studies that show that these different concepts in this model actually predict individual well-being. And then one final um, model that we always like to share is the model that we were building um, uh, 10 years ago and that we still have an assessment based off of. And this is um, an evolution of some of the other things I was just sharing with you. For sure, a component that's related to um, emotional well-being and your, psycho your psychological well-being. But the physical well-being piece is, plays out in our model pretty strong. And then work well-being, all the things that happen to you while you're at work and how much that affects your life. Um, we also in our model have um, an emphasis on the idea of actualization or realizing your potential. If you go back to that definition, we think that's a really important part of that. And then finally, around the whole outside of the circle is the concept of, gosh, if we're really focusing on an organization supporting well-being and supporting well-being improvement, the culture of the organization or those norms and values and beliefs of the organization are really going to influence um, a person's ability to have well-being and, and improve their well-being. So those are a couple just basic theoretical foundation um, pieces that I wanted to share with you. There's a lot more in the positive psychology literature, and the, the research is just growing and becoming much, um, there's a lot of research evidence now to say that these concepts really matter and make a difference. talk a little bit about the, the history behind well-being. I think it, it's a pretty important piece to understand because it's, it lays the groundwork for where we are now in this, in this field of wellness slash well-being. So way back in the 1800s, it's really one of the first times where um, people were talking about the concept of happiness. And there was philosophical, um, there were philosophers who were really focusing on this topic. There were Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill who were talking about the idea of how do you maximize happiness? How do you ensure the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people? And at the same time also was just this concept of character strength, which was the idea of is there something about me that actually can make me happier. So if I have more courage, I might be happier. If I'm braver, I might be happier. So the, the point of calling out the 1800s is really when happiness was first talked about as something to study and something that people could actually control in their lives. And then if you fast, fast forward quite a bit to the 60s, this is when the medical model of wellness first began. And the idea here was how can we try to reduce the number of bad things that happen at work? How can we make sure we don't have so many accidents? How can we make sure that um, people aren't spending all their time smoking <laughs> at smoking breaks? And it was the, really coming at it from a medical model, meaning what's wrong with people or how can we actually make bad things decrease, prevent bad things? So um, th then after that, there was a bit of a transition to, okay, let's try to prevent this. Let's try to make it so that people aren't having accidents at work. Let's try to get people to stop smoking. So that was all going on in, in the 60s. And in the 90s is when the medical model um, was starting to still, is still holding true, but there was starting to be this concept of positive psychology. So positive psychology is the study of what's right with people. Typically, um, psychology before that was mostly focused on what was wrong from a psychological perspective. So a lot of a focus on schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but in the 90s was when the shift started to happen around, let's study what's right with people. Can we understand how people have a high quality life? To how we can really understand how people make sure that they're having, um, that they're realizing their potential. Before that, there hadn't been very much research on the topic. Um, within positive psychology, there was even some disagreements around the idea of what is well-being, and there was a big kind of philosophical fight around the concept of happiness versus realizing potential and which one really was well-being. Um, and now we've come to the conclusion over time that it's actually both of those things. So then in the 2000s, that's when the concept of 
um, wellness and positive psychology really intersected with each other. Um, so that's where you see a lot of wellness programs are starting to call themselves well-being programs. And you'll also see wellness programs now um, that have a really strong component of the medical model, right, thinking about people as health risks, and then combining that with more of the quality of life components, too. So sometimes we see both of those threads play out pretty, um, pretty strongly in existing wellness programs. So now in the, in the 2010s and, and on, the focus is a lot more on the concept of a whole person. So thinking about not just what happens at work, but how what happens outside of work influences work and vice versa. So how work and life overlap and really how, what the employee experience is like in general, and how do we really optimize human performance. So as we look back over time and think about how this concept of well-being is really formed, there's a big thread and kind of big intersection with wellness, and wellness coming from the perspective of reducing bad things from happening with positive psychology. So why does well-being matter? So first, we, we firmly believe, and there's good um, empirical evidence to support, that the whole employee matters. So a couple statistics here are pretty um, telling. 47% of employees say problems in their personal life affect their performance at work. And HR people, 37% say employees miss work due to things like financial emergencies, things you wouldn't typically think of as being related to work. We're seeing more and more that the whole system of a person influences other aspects of the person. So for example, you might have um, some stress at work. You might be feeling stressed out by your manager. How does that stress actually affect your emotional well-being? And then if you're feeling emotionally, um, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling like you're threatened by what's going on at work, then you probably, you could also then feel that physically. So the idea of the whole person as a system and how all of those different pieces interact with each other is becoming much more of um, a norm and much more of a, a shared understanding. Stress is one of the main ways that we talk about the whole employee, um, meaning that you can feel stress from all different aspects of your life, and that stress has a real dollar implication. So 60% of all illnesses are really caused by stress, and most doctor visits are because of stress. So we're seeing that stress, which again can come from financial stress, it could come from work stress, it could come from things that are happening in your personal life, in your relationships, that all the different aspects of yourself can cause stress, and there are real um, dollar values that we can start associating with stress. So if we accept the idea that people are systems and all aspects of, of yourself are related to each other, the next idea is if we think about um, the, the relationship between somebody um, their well-being at work and how engaged they are. So let's talk about employee engagement. So when we're talking about engagement here, we're not talking about are they engaged in the wellness program. We're talking about employee engagement and the concept of really having a strong emotional connection to the work. And what we're starting to see is there are statistical relationships between having well-being and being engaged at work. In fact, we did a study last year that showed that when employees feel that their employer cares about their well-being, they're 38% more engaged at work. And there are other research studies that are really showing this connection. So why would that be? So there are some different pieces of this that we're really trying to break down and understand. So first of all, we think that if you have well-being, more than likely, that means you're taking care of yourself and you might have the energy that might be a precursor to you being able to be engaged in work because engagement in work really is about energy. So that's one piece. It also could be about feeling valued and feeling like your organization cares about you if, if, if they care about 
if they're showing that they care about your well-being. If the organization cares about you, that probably sets the stage for employee engagement as well. So we're, we're doing some research to really understand what specific aspects of well-being are the most related to the concept of employee engagement. There's also some interesting research that's, um, that's come out recently to show that if you have employee engagement, you actually have more well-being in your life. So you could see that as maybe a reciprocal relationship. And what we think is going on with um, employee engagement driving well-being is that there's probably something related to meaning and purpose and feeling like your time's well spent and feeling like you're valued that goes back and influences your overall well-being. So we're seeing more and more research to support the connection between well-being and employee engagement. So what's pretty amazing about drawing that connection is there is a lot of research to say that employee engagement is related to important business outcomes. So it's becoming um, what I consider in my field a truism. There's so much research and so much consistent research that shows that employee engagement drives great business outcomes. So organizations with high employee engagement tend to do really well from a financial perspective. Better shareholder returns, they're more profitable, um, they have, they're more likely to be, have a high performance um, than companies that have low employee engagement. Also, the uh, more engaged workforce means that you um, have employees who are less likely to leave, they're less likely to have accidents, and also that the whole um, organization just tends to have higher levels of growth. So these are just a, this is just a sample of some of the research studies that are showing the connection between employee engagement and business outcomes. So one of the things that we are starting to um, really think more about is, wouldn't it be great if we could encourage organizations to have a focus on both well-being and employee engagement? And this is an interesting study that showed if you had both of these in place, both high levels of well-being and employee engagement, there's just great results that, that come from that. So less likely to look for a job, um, more likely to evaluate their lives overall in more high, uh, highly, um, also more likely to volunteer, interestingly enough. So what we think might be going on here is that well-being and a focus on well-being really allows for us to sustain employee engagement. So the sustainability of employee engagement is a pretty important topic. Um, there has um, been also some really interesting research on the concept of burnout or the idea of being engaged for long periods of time and just how hard that is to maintain. So we think organizations that focus both on this concept of well-being and engagement will be able to sustain those high levels of performance and connectedness over time. So we're really trying to encourage our customers to think a little differently about this concept of well-being. So instead of thinking about well-being from the perspective of a wellness program that the benefits organization owns, we're trying to think about well-being as a fundamental piece of really having a great organization. So switching from just a, a focus on health, so this culture of health idea, to more of a great company model. So the virtuous circle that we think happens here is that if you invest in your employees' well-being, they're more likely to be engaged. And if they're more engaged, you're going to get better business outcomes, and you'll probably be recognized for that. And we think that that could really be a virtuous circle that could grow and really help an organization thrive. So moving um, these wellness programs and a focus on well-being away from something that's just a nice offering that our benefits group delivers to something that actually has much more of a broad and large impact on the organization, we think um, is pretty powerful. So how do you measure well-being? So in the beginning, I had told you um, that really nobody but the person can say 
if they have well-being or not. So it's really important that the person is is answering the questions related to well-being. So we um, highly recommend that organizations think about using a well-being assessment. And it's really a questionnaire that's primarily used to create self-awareness. So a person can really learn about areas where they have great strengths from a well-being perspective and maybe some areas that they might want to improve. Uh, there was a recent research study that showed that well-being assessments are actually better predictors of productivity than typical health risk assessments. So we're seeing that this more comprehensive view actually does a better job than thinking about just their phys um, an employee's physical health. So once we measure that well-being, we oftentimes um, connect that with biometrics. So thinking about someone's BMI, thinking about their blood pressure, thinking about anything that um, is really related to uh, being an indicator of physical health, that we think those things combined can do a lot to really help um, a person think about where they might want to focus their energy. And from there, most well-being programs would recommend some things for people to focus on and really point them in the direction of challenges and resources that would allow them to start making some improvements. There are all different kinds of survey questions if people are working on their own well-being assessments, but here's just a sample of some of the things that we really think are important. And it's a lot about how the organization is supporting well-being, so my employer caring about well-being, that my employer supports me in living a healthier life, that the leaders are good role models. We think those pieces are pretty important, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. One of the things that traditionally many wellness programs have focused on is just participation in the program. So really thinking about, are people even clinky, clicking on links? Are they doing the things we want them to do? And what we believe is that that, again, is sort of a smaller way of thinking about the power of well-being. Uh, we really encourage our customers to think about what are the bigger, bigger business goals that you're really trying to influence? What are the big um, strategic ways that you could connect well-being um, so that you can make a bigger impact? So, for example, you might decide that productivity is one of the things that you care the most about, and why not try to link and connect well-being with productivity output? Um, for example, some um, customers we've worked with have talked about um, sales in individual stores, connecting well-being results at the aggregate level with the sales results of individual stores. Also, customer satisfaction is another important one. You could also think about HR types of goals, so employee engagement, retention, um, and then, of course, program goals for sure around uh, wellness program goals, but we encourage our organizations to think bigger and broader around the impact that you want to have. It's important, of course, to be clear about this in the beginning, right? To think about what are the outcomes that are most important for, uh, for your program um, in advance of actually designing it. Another thing um, that we are, uh, think is pretty interesting is trying to connect well-being data with other kinds of data, again, than just things that are specific to the program. So what if you could show the connection between well-being in your organization and the use of sick leave or the actual um, turnover costs in your organization? We've been working with some of our customers around showing these connections and really showing that, again, there's this bigger picture and this bigger, um, this bigger piece that we're trying to influence that isn't just about physical health. Uh, we also like to con um, connect the concept of well-being with employee survey results, um, seeing more and more, again, that idea that, wow, if you have higher levels of well-being, there's also other things that that's related to, and we're finding things like job satisfaction, higher fit with the organization um, compared to groups that have lower well-being. So we're, we're seeing some of these more interesting um, kind of bigger connections hold out from a statistical perspective when we work with our customers. So we've talked about 
the definition of well-being. We've talked about the evolution of well-being and even how you measure it. Let's talk a little bit about improving well-being. So if you think about any one person, maybe these are some of the things that this person might be focused on. So maybe it's physical health, maybe it's financial well-being or work or emotional. What we believe is that it's great for organizations to care about that and to really support this person in her well-being journey. But just as important to that is that the organization supports her well-being. So let's talk about organizational support for well-being. In order for um, this person in the picture, for her to really feel supported, some different things need to happen from a support perspective. First of all, there needs to be some local support for her. So how does her manager talk to her about well-being? How does her manager show through body language, through um, actual verbal um, language, through um, his or her behavior, that there's support there for her. And then what about the team and the peers that are around her as well? Do they encourage her? Do they help her think about her well-being improvement? Um, and then other social networks, are there other people in the organization that are in some way, shape, or, or form supporting her and making it possible for her to focus on her well-being? So you could think about at the manager level, just things like um, workload balance. How does the manager help that person maybe take a little bit of time away from work to go attend a class on financial well-being? How does that person, um, how does that manager just ask questions about progress against her well-being improvement goals? And then the team, do, do the team members cover for her? Um, do they offer verbal support? Do they really, um, they think about reciprocity, that they take turns around focusing on their own well-being? So there's a lot of different ways that this could play out at the local level. One other thing I'd like to point out is just the idea of the physical work environment. Does the physical work environment, is it one that feels energizing? Does it feel like it's a place that's positive? Does it feel like there are um, what we call nudges and defaults, right? Are there healthy things that are around in the workplace? And it's not always, it's not just things like healthy snacks. It's also, is there good lighting? You know, is there op the opportunity to go outside and walk around the block? So what is the physical work environment like? So we, we consider those four areas local support. On top of that is what is a little bit broader. It's more of the organizational wide support. So how do leaders, how do they show that they are supportive of well-being improvement? So they, are they role models? Uh, are they reinforcers? Do they talk to people about their own well-being improvement and, and really encourage them? Do they talk about how the focus on well-being improvement really matters to them? It matters to the business. It matters to the culture. Uh, is there a st any strategic alignment? We've um, seen some interesting things from our customers around how they connect well-being to their business strategy. For example, uh, we have a, a pediatric hospital that we work with, and they've really made a strong connection between the doctor and nurse and staff well-being and how that influences their ability to serve their customers who are kids. So they talk with their kids about their own well-being experiences and get them to really think about well-being in a more holistic way. So you can connect the concept of well-being to your business strategy. It can make it so much um, more of uh, a norm or a value that everybody sees as important. And then finally, how does the culture of the organization support well-being. So this is a pretty important topic, so we're going to go a little deeper on culture. So culture is really about the underlying norms and values and beliefs of the organization. So it really tells people how to behave. It sends messages from the day that the person starts in the organization about how we do things around here. So uh, my favorite example is one where I was starting to work in a large company, and I'd just been into my first week there, 
and I was asked to write a memo, and that memo was something I'd never written in that kind of a company before, so I drafted it and then thought, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if I had somebody to read that memo? I was sitting in this organization. Everybody sat in an uh, office with their door closed, and I went next door, opened my door, went next door to the person next to me and asked her to read it. Well, it, could, it was very clear from her body language and the fact that she continued to type as I asked her for help that she wasn't really into it and that she wasn't really um, – it wasn't something that was a priority for her, but she said she would read it for me. Um, and so then I went back to my office and closed the door and thought, gosh, I wonder if I should go back and ask her if she's going to do this for real today or tomorrow. So I ended up giving her plenty of time. I went back the next day, and she hadn't read it. She said, it's fine. It, and I really got the message loud and clear from her that, I don't ask people for help in this company. That's something that um, I just have to do on my own. So what happens in organizations is when you first start there, you get messages about how things happen there and the right way to do things in order to fit into the culture. That's, that's a negative example, but there's plenty of positive examples as well. Um, in the organization here at Limeade, that when I first started here, everybody um, is pretty – diligent about giving regular peer feedback and we have some tools that support that and we also display the recognition that we give each other on screens that everybody can see and I realized that I hadn't in my prior roles and prior jobs I wasn't really good about doing that regular feedback and this norm and value started to encourage me to do something that I felt was much more positive. So what happens with culture is when, especially when somebody's new to an organization, they start getting the message about how things are supposed to go and how things are supposed to work. And it really drives the performance of employees. So that's why we care a lot about culture. You start conforming to the way things are done in an organization, and sometimes it works, it's really good, and it's, it's helpful for the business strategy, and other times not so much. So... We have been thinking here at Limeade, if culture matters, what might be the most important attributes for well-being improvement from a cultural perspective? So we um, think that these 10 cultural attributes might be some of the most important ones. I'm not going to go over all of them in detail, but let me just take a couple of them. So the concept of trust is really important to, the, um, well, to well-being. So first of all, is the organization trusting? That is, does it assume employees will always do the right thing? And just, and just the opposite also, is it trustworthy? Is the or, can the organization be counted on to do the right thing? So we think that those two aspects of trust could be pretty important to a well-being program. If trust is in place, it's probably more likely that people will participate in the program and, and actually um, really uh, try to improve their own well-being. So a couple others, um, resiliency. The idea of, you know, is, does, does the organization in general bounce back from difficulties? Does the organization persevere? Is the organization optimistic? Does it see possibilities? Is it positive and enthusiastic? So we think that these 10 attributes might be pretty important for um, an organization to be successful with its well-being improvement efforts. At the end of this presentation, there's a real short um, survey that I'll describe to you, but it basically touches on these 10 points and really allows you to see where you might be, how ready your organization might be for well-being improvement. When we think about the process for actually improving well-being, we think it follows these six basic steps. So first, you create awareness, and we tend to use a well-being assessment to do that. You offer ideas and recommendations for how to improve them. You make sure that the organization is supporting the person in their well-being improvement, and you measure that change over time. We also think there's something important about recognizing and rewarding um, recognizing and rewarding well-being improvement, and remember back to that self-determination theory where people need to feel a sense of competence, that they're actually mastering things. And then, of course, it's one of, the, like anything that really is important in life, you're never really done, and that you can continue to improve. 
we wanted to share with you just a really brief example of one of our customers. So again, um, so LimeMate is a corporate wellness technology company, and we work with um, lots of different kinds of customers. And this is one of um, one of our favorite customers, Bloodworks Northwest. And what they have done is really connected their program to their business strategy. So you can see here this example that, that for employees, they're actually um, in, um, asked to set up their own uh, blood drive, to schedule a blood drive in their, in their community. So that's one of the things that they're asked to do. And you, we also make sure that the program is set up so that it really is aligned to their um, their culture, so you can see here just the colors are aligned to the culture and the way that we have um, labeled the program, the name of the program is as well. And the bigger piece here is around how they even think about well-being in general. They have a total well-being approach um, to their program. So you can see there's some things in here that you might see in other wellness programs for sure, like physical fitness and EAP programs and biometrics, but some other broader things like financial planning and volunteering and their own values. They also connect to their training and development through um, this program. So they're really thinking about the whole person and all the different ways that they might support the whole person. And what they found, we've been working with them for a while, uh, over, I guess, over four years now, that participation has really increased over that time from 40% to 89% program participation. They think because of these, this bigger whole person connection and because they really um, connect this with their business strategy. So their business strategy is about advancing health in the community, and they think that there are real ways for employees to participate in that and really um, feel that connection with the overall um, mission of the company. So just, just really quickly, the way we've done this with them is creating the awareness through the assessment, giving recommendations. For example, here, here's one of their core values around demonstrating respect, and then they have real visible ways that the organization is supporting employees in that well-being improvement. And then they measure their progress. They've seen some really cool things happen, a reduction in, in emergency room visits, improvements in, in their risk factors. But they also talk about improvements with employees feeling more connected to the organization. They also do a lot, even besides Amazon gift cards, to recognize and reward improvement. Um, but they also are committed to the long term. They know this is something that they're, it's not just a program that's done in a year, it's ongoing. So with all that said, what's the future of well-being? We believe that more and more organizations are going to see that well-being isn't just a benefits offering. It's actually a prerequisite to having true engagement at work. If you really want to have those amazing outcomes, if you want people to want to come to work every day, you're going to have to focus on well-being. We also think there's going to be a shift away from the concept of just reducing health care costs. The well-being is much bigger and broader than that. Also, that these programs are going to have to be something that employees don't feel done to as they go through it, that it's something that they want to participate in, and in fact, it's, it's something they're really excited about participating in. We also think that there has to be organizational support and that we don't just put this on employees as something for them to go fix and figure out, that the organization plays just as strong a role in helping that happen, and that the more we can connect this with the vision and the business strategy, the more that employees can feel like they're supported, the more they can feel like this is something that they should take the time to do, and the more the organization is going to see those better business outcomes. So some really simple ways for those of you who are um, have well-being programs that you manage, there's some simple ways to maybe think about taking it to the next level. First of all, just get, getting really clear about some ways that you can align the well-being or wellness program to your business strategy. Is there something about the way you serve your customers? Is there something about how you want to think about employee engagement? What are the ways that you could take this to the next level and really think about your program in broader ways? How might you think about showing organizational support? 
Many organizations have understood that it's so important to have leaders to be really supportive, but what about managers? How are we really equipping our managers to support well-being? And then next, how do we break down HR silos? How do we move away from thinking about wellness programs sit in a benefits group and employee engagement sits in the group that runs the employee survey and anybody who's working on culture, you know, that's a whole different group altogether. How do we break down these HR silos and really pull these concepts together in a way that's meaningful to employees? And then finally, how do we make sure we're measuring organizational level outcomes, moving away from just thinking about participation in the wellness platform? So finally, just some key takeaways for you. I hope that you're seeing that more and more this concept of well-being is not just fluff. It's not just this nice-to-have idea. There's actually a lot of research support. There's starting to be more and more of a clear methodology and also evidence that shows that well-being is very important to organizations. We also hope you take away that organizational is, support is critical for well-being improvement, meaning that we can't just put this on an individual employee and not have any of the defaults and nudges and the things that, that are around the employee when they come back to work. We have to have those things that are supporting that employee, employee in their well-being um, improvement journey. And then finally, we think that the greatest companies to work for are going to put well-being first. Those companies that are really progressive, the ones that are the greatest attractors of talent, are the ones that are going to understand this idea of well-being and, and very much take it seriously. All right, so I think we have a little time now for some Q&A if people have questions. Also, just a reminder that in um, the, I think in your resources link, there is um, a, an ability to post these questions and also to the quiz. Um, this quiz is a pretty, really easy, simple quiz. It's, a, a, it's just trying to touch on those 10 cultural attributes that are important for well-being improvement. And you can go through that quiz and see where your organization falls, whether or not they're fully ready to take on well-being and well-being improvement, or if maybe there's some more work that's needed in, with, from a cultural perspective. All right, so I think we might have a few questions. Yes, thanks so much for that excellent presentation, Laura. At this yes. point, we'll proceed into the Q. Oh. We'll proceed into the Q and A portion of the program. Please access the purple Q and A icon on the on the button menu below your slides. Type in your question and click submit. With that, we're going to go ahead and get into those questions. All right, our first one. How can you re-engage employees who don't trust that leadership has their best interest in mind? That is a, such a good question. And I think um, there's multiple, there's some really interesting research actually on the concept of trust. And there's multiple ways that need to be addressed. So it depends on the severity of the trust breakdown. Um, the first thing, if, if it's pretty severe, there actually has to be really public apologies for why those things happened. So um, I think that's one of the things that needs to happen is there's an acknowledgement, a visibility to the issue and an apology for the reason why people are feeling a lack of trust. And so that sometimes that's a special case scenario. Um, I think in other cases, there has to be some real um, visible commitment from leadership around improving trust and their own actions have to be the first and foremost um, area that gets tackled. I've, I've found in working on culture in a lot of different organizations that there's a bit of a, um, you know, wanting to, to talk a lot about it, but then there's inconsistent actions on behalf of leaders around actually um, being consistent with the area they're trying to improve. So they talk about, you know, this stuff is important, but then employees will see um, that their actions aren't really aligned. So it's important for leaders to recognize that, unfortunately, their every action they take is like, a, you know, a megaphone, um, that people read in a lot to the things that leaders do and say. So it's really important for there to be some consistency there. So trust is a pretty important um, area that probably could be its own topic uh, for sure. And I think 
the more that we recognize how important that is to focusing on something like well-being, it's, it's pretty critical because well-being is such a personal thing. And if we don't really address trust and really make sure that, that employees understand we're doing this with their best interest, um, it probably won't get a lot of participation. All right, we have another question from someone who works for a government agency. Keeping that in mind, how do you help create a wellness culture when there are so many obstacles and not enough interest and support? That's a, yeah, and I get that the government agency piece is hard. We work with a couple different um, government agencies, and I think the complexity of those organizations is not a small feat, right? Really thinking about all the different kinds of organizations that are within a government agency, it's, it's hard. Um, so I think what, where you should probably start is what does matter to the organization? What do you know for sure is something that they might care about? So for example, one of the government agencies we've worked with, what they were really focusing on was the idea of let's try to think about performance and really not thinking about um, moving away from people just coming to their day jobs and not really giving it their all, how could we think about people being actually high performers? And so we connected the concept of well-being to that idea of high performance, and we were able to show some really interesting statistical relationships between those two things. And so then they, they really have um, gotten more excited about the well-being program. So I think for really any company that's struggling with putting into place a new program, thinking about what you know for sure matters to the organization. Because more than likely, I bet you can show the human component of that, the well-being piece of that, and why well-being could be a helpful lever to pull to influence that outcome. Here's another question. How can I get upper management to support and encourage wellness? Yeah, that's, and, and it's so important, right, to have, make sure that the leaders, leaders can do so much. I think sometimes they forget how powerful they are and just the, what, the way they talk about a program like this, the way that they themselves actually do things that are supportive um, of a program like this. So um, I think it is pretty critical to get them to care. Now, if it, I would really think about for each leader – what is it that matters to them? So, you know, we definitely have worked with customers who have these leaders who are crazy, you know, do amazing physical things, like um, they run marathons, and it's really easy to see how, how that could connect to a well-being program. But I think if you don't necessarily have that, I'm betting that in some way, shape, or form, you have a leader who has well-being in their life in some way or that they've struggled with well-being. Another really um, powerful approach is to get a leader to talk about their own struggles and how maybe I've heard about leaders who've talked about, you know, they worked so much that they their marriage ended in divorce or that they've really had to have some real changes in their life from a well-being perspective. And that can be really powerful because it shows them as human beings, right? It shows that they're humble. And to get them to talk about their well-being journey, again, even if it's not that they're marathon runners, but that, they, that they've struggled and that they're trying to um, improve their own well-being can be so powerful. So if you, if you have... Um, a leader who could do that, that can go a long way. Another approach is to think about, gosh, what, what does matter to this leader? If they tend to be a metrics or a data-driven type of person, if showing, showing them the research that's really starting to become, again, loud and clear that says that if we care about well-being, we're going to get better employee engagement, and better employee engagement leads to better business results. So I think that's it's a little bit about reading what is important to your CEO and trying to use that lever um, to influence them to care about the program. Um, luckily, you know, there are a lot of organizations who the CEO is completely or the leadership team understands the value because they've gone through it themselves. And the more that that story could be told, I think the more authentic it really is. Laura, do you believe that premium differentials are a way to show organizational support for wellness, or do you think it hinders the company's culture? That's a that's a really good question, and that's one that you know we've talked a lot about. We think actually 
it can show that there's something real and meaty behind the focus on well-being improvement. What we feel strongly about is that it's all about how you do that. It's about how you communicate it. It's about how employees feel like it's something that they're more rewarded for versus something that gets taken away from them. Um, the more that employees understand why you want to do that can make all the difference in whether or not this creates trust or whether it breaks down trust. So we think that having something that's that shows that this matters a lot to you as an organization, you know, it's not a $5 Starbucks gift card, that this is something that really we're putting something behind, um, but but we think that it's important how that goes down. And again, we, we try to work more towards the concept of in incentives versus disincentives. So what is something that you can earn versus something that gets taken away from you? So incentives are really important, and just the idea also of thinking about in any incentive design how you how you make a, a really strong mix between extrinsic rewards and intrinsic motivation. There's some really um, powerful things you can do to connect the participation in a well-being program with things that me are meaningful to employees, things that. Um, actually make them feel more connected to the organization. So, so yeah, so really thinking about incenting people, how you go about talking about the premium differential, how that feels, and, and how it really tries to build trust and not break it down. Do you have a suggestion for productivity centers such as call centers and data processing? It feels like they end up being left out of workday activities due to the limited control over their schedule. Mm. Oh, I know. This, that's so hard. I've worked with call centers before um, where it feels like they're so constrained. And, you know, this, one of the things that I've worked with call centers is I really try to question a lot of the assumptions that people who are managing those functions have, that we can't take those breaks or that we can't make that time. Um, and because I think that there's something on the other side of that that you get in return for making that time, for making something that's associated with well-being a priority. I, I really believe you'll see um, higher levels of productivity and, and retention. And call center attrition tends to be so high. If you can really focus on um, in those employees seeing that you value them, that you take time out of the day, you take time out of you know the profit making that you're trying to focus on, and really that they are an important part of the equation so much that it's built into the day, I think the long-term benefits will be there. Uh, so I really, when I've worked with different call centers, I try to get to question that a little bit. Um, I also think it, one of the things that I've seen some companies do is get the employees to also come up with creative ways for how to build it into the day also. Sometimes in the way they rotate schedules, sometimes in the way they take their lunches, there's some, there is some room in there for um, being creative and having time for well-being improvement. And I think the best people to help figure that out are the people who are in those roles. We have time for one more question. So let's see. Okay, we are a transportation company with our drivers living all around the U.S. and driving all across the U.S. What is the best way to engage these employees when we have only the options of email and text messaging to reach out to them? Oh, that's, I get it. That's got to be so hard. Um, I wonder about things like um, podcasts and ways for them to, to actually be listening to things as they're driving, perhaps. I don't know if that's practical or feasible. I also think that within the whole realm of well-being, really getting people to think broadly. Because I think that we do have such a tendency to, to focus mostly on physical well-being. And of course, it, physical well-being is such an important piece of the puzzle. But what if we could get people to do exercises around mindfulness? What if we could get people to do exercises around the concept of how we frame things in our mind and how we can change the way we think about things? 
Um, what if you could actually get them to spend time as they're driving, listening to those kinds of things or doing exercises that don't obviously require them to be distracted? Um, so I would, I would think that this might be an opportunity to be really creative about the definition of well-being for your employees. And also, you know, again, I always love to, to get people to start with ideas from people who are in the roles too, right? What, what suggestions do they have? What ideas do they have? Even how they think about the breaks that they take and how that they can be thought of a little bit differently. So um, I get that that's a, probably a huge challenge, but I think that there might be some creative solutions to help. Some great information, some great questions, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to more of yeah. them today. But we'd like to thank you, hey, Laura, thank for you. taking your time to present to us. Oh, of course. Thank you so much. And we'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors at LimeAid, but mostly let's also say thank you to the audience for their participation in today's webinar. For those of you who have asked, you can find materials for today's event and all Workforce webinars archived at www.workforce.com or simply click the Workforce icon at the bottom of your screen. Also, if you enjoyed today's presentation, please take a moment to fill out our post-event survey, which will appear after this webinar ends. Your feedback is very important to us and will help improve our future webinars. Thanks once more to our attendees around the world. We'll see you all back here next Thursday, or I'm sorry, Thursday, May 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for our workforce webinar, Bloomberg's High Touch White Glove Candidate Experience, Investing in Your Talent Pipeline. Have a great day.